Shiram Kanan is the founder of Eigenlayer and the director of University of Washington's Blockchain Lab. His research at UW focuses on distributed computing, information theory, queuing theory, networking, coding theory, and game theory of blockchain systems. Eigenlayer is a proof of stake validation marketplace that reuses stake capital and existing validation infrastructure. With Eigenlayer, Ethereum can enable permissionless and modular innovation across all blockchain layers. Today, we dive into Shiram's background in academia, how the blockchain space piqued his interest, and the hype around Eigenlayer. But first, Shiram is going to tell us exactly what he's up to at Eigenlayer and how he merges both a data availability layer and a restaking platform. We are trying to get the product to mainnet, so that's that's been most of our focus. So uh, we're building the Eigenlayer core uh, smart contracts where you know stakers can participate, as well as a data availability layer built on top of Eigenlayer called EigenDA. So most of the work right now is in the development. We are on a private testnet. We want to go to a public testnet and to a mainnet in the uh, coming quarters, like Q2, Q3. So that's that's been all our focus at uh, Eigenlayer. Amazing. All eyes to mainnet. I know it was a, a big question on the Twitter uh, for you is around the testnet. So excited to dive into that in a bit. And I know everyone's been buzzing about Eigenlayer. So really excited to dig in. But first, I would love to just start, you know, you have an academic background. What made you get interested in crypto? Yeah, uh, you know, as an academic, one of the things that uh, uh, one of the reasons I got in is to kind of contribute my little portion to the innovation landscape. And uh, I, as I was thinking through, like, you know, I've had a journey through various areas, through peer-to-peer -peer wireless systems, to computational genomics and AI, and most recently to blockchains. I think uh, I got into crypto mainly because it's going one level meta, you know, uh, instead of me contributing to innovation myself, how can I enable many people, everybody out there in the world to come and contribute to innovation? And for the first time, we have this amazing paradigm where to contribute to innovation, you don't need to be trusted. You can be an anon, you can be a pseudonymous person and still create new innovations and throw it on top of a huge existing trust network like Ethereum so that you, know, you yourself don't need to be uh, trusted. I think one uh, mental model that I like here is, you know, we talk about uh, don't discriminate, you know, people from races, religions, sexes, like, you know, whatever dimensions. But uh, crypto with the pseudonymous economy thing is actually can't discriminate. Like, I don't know who Satoshi is. I don't know who, you know, so many people are who have started amazing projects and man, woman, child, Anybody alien, everybody is equal. That's an amazing world that crypto can beckon. Totally. I know some days I wish that I had started anonymously in my journey, but here we are, fully public. Uh, but yeah, I think permissionless technology and decentralized trust are so powerful. And I'm excited to kind of dig into why you're so passionate about that. But first, let's talk a little bit about the academic side of things. So many academics are quite skeptical of crypto. Do you have any view on that? Maybe why why it is? Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, subject to that myself, to, that, uh, <laughs> to those opinions. And many of my colleagues think I was doing perfectly fine working on human genomics. And now, you know, working on this crazy area seems like it makes no sense. Um, I think it is unusual that an area triggers so much polarized opinion that and, and polarization mainly in the negative direction. There is a small group of uh, hardcore people like us who think that this is going to change the world in every way. But there is the I think the reason is that some of the initial ways in which these technologies got used colored like the opinions of people into like what the scope of this technology is. When I used to, you know, uh, when some of my colleagues wrote like uh, for grants from the National Science Foundation to work on blockchains, they would get responses like, why are you building on technologies that's used by criminals, right? Like this is... Uh, it maybe was true in, to some extent at some time for some particular technology, but the broader utility of this is uh, is so much that 
we cannot afford to not build this, you know. So, but I think that is the, uh, and uh, and a lot of the interesting thing is people who built a certain paradigm are usually the most reluctant to change from that paradigm. So I find, for example, people who successfully led the transition to the cloud are the most resistant to the blockchain paradigm. Even people outside that, like, you know, are, are don't have much opinion. But when you go to like computer scientists who worked on the cloud paradigm, they are like, yeah, you know, this does everything. Like, why why do we need this other thing? And uh, yeah, so that that is the opinion, the dominant opinion, I think, in the academic landscape. Uh, the one way that I kind of nerd snipe a bunch of academics into working on blockchain is to just like explain some of the cool problems in game theory in uh, um, in distributed systems that comes out of it. But still many people, even some people who work on it for that purpose are not driven by the core value proposition that blockchains can actually offer. And if you don't have your fundamental motivations aligned with that value, you'll just drop it when it's not hot anymore. Between nerd sniping, I love that terminology, and red pilling, I think you're kind of doing God's work. It's really important. I think we all had that initial moment where we're like, oh no, this is a scam. I definitely did back in, in 2011 after trying to buy it, though, admittedly. Um, and so I think it's it's a natural evolution for people to kind of have that reaction, but then go deeper. Uh, and it's great that you're helping them do that. And I guess with that, coming from an academic background, you have been super involved in the Ethereum community. You go to the ETH events, uh, you're out and about. What surprised you most about the Ethereum community so far? Yeah, the most uh, interesting thing was, you know, I, I've i interacted with the Ethereum researchers for over like three, four years now. But, you know, uh, last year, first time I went to ETH Denver, when actually that's the first community, crypto community conference that I actually went to other than academic conferences. And, you know, I came back and I told my friends that, hey, you know, I went to this conference and now I'm back and I become a Ethereum guy. And they, and I, I, I said, like, I don't hold ETH. I don't really like, you know, I didn't really contribute much to the Ethereum protocol in any way. Uh, I'm not a user of any of the DeFi dApps, at least as of that time. But actually, I'm, I'm, I'm an Ethereum guy because there is this vibes, right, like of... You know, these are the values that we're building for, you know, decentralized trust, permissionless innovation, credible neutrality. And these values are ranked higher than any individual. And that is something so unusual to find a movement genuinely built on principles that are for net positive public goods funding is another principle that the Ethereum community is very much aligned towards. And, you know, I could not be more more aligned than that to these principles. Uh, so I, I said, okay, this is this is awesome. It's like finding home. I love that. Amazing. Yeah, I always recommend to anyone new in the space going to events is is by far the, the main thing that you need to do and just talk to people and get to know the community because so much of the crypto culture is about that. Uh, and with that, you know, this might be a little more of a spicy question, but academic projects and tokens haven't gotten the best rap. Uh, in the crypto space. So what would you say to people that might call Eigenlayer an academic project? <laughs> it took me many years to realize that that's a slur that, uh, rather than a credit. <laughs> okay, but uh, here is the thing. Actually, you know, Eigenlayer is intending to solve the root of the problem of why these like academic projects had to go a certain way and they shouldn't have to. And, you know, Basically, academics are good at coming up with new technologies, right? They're good at coming up with new systems, how to build them, how to optimize them. This is what we kind of, this is all of like uh, academic research in distributed systems in game theory, how to build these systems that work better. But the only way you could do it with uh, the current setup is if you have a new idea for a consensus protocol, if you have a new idea for a scaling protocol, if you have a new idea for data storage, if you had a new idea for indexing, anything new, like the only way you could do this as of today is to go and start a new network. And a new network is community plus technology. And, you know, academics are not community builders. It's just a complete, utter mismatch. I think that is what we realized actually, like when we had this, 
you know, protocol called Prism like four years back. And we were thinking about the first thing we did is we just wanted somebody to use it. We didn't want, you know, any uh, economic credit for it. We went to Bitcoin and said, you know, attended scaling Bitcoin and gave a talk there. Then we went to Ethereum and gave a kind of talk to the Ethereum research guys. And we realized that each of these protocols, you know, firstly, more the decentralized the protocol, the more difficult it is to impact it in, and change it in any way, right? Because of course, decentralization means like more democratic upgrades and democracy means like things happen slowly. It's a feature, it's not a bug. So it's you can't even complain about it. And so that's what happened in these communities. And I would say like Ethereum was more agile than Bitcoin, which is clearly proven itself again and again with 1559 and the merge and roll up era and all these things. But still, you know, there is only one protocol that would one consensus protocol that would power the Ethereum blockchain and that had to fit into so many other constraints. So th this is something we realized, okay, you know, you can't do it on Bitcoin. You can't, you know, Ethereum's not gonna upgrade. So then what choices do I have? The only choice I would have had at that time is to go and start a new L1. And this is what all these other people had to do out of compulsion. Like the only, you know, if you're a creator, your imperative is to take your creation somewhere. And like you try it and none of the existing ones had any framework to accommodate it. So they said, okay, you know, I'm just gonna go and do this other thing. and. You have to completely like, you know, do a whole other thing, which is build a community. And uh, th th that's the one thing I realized, you know, over the last maybe two, three years is that the Ethereum protocol is not necessarily living in the decentralized set of nodes that are validating the blockchain. It's really living in the hearts and minds of these like 50 million people who have like, who like and use this protocol. And I think that is just a completely different scale of what we mean by community and so and 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 so as as we realize this what eigenlayer intends to do is to enable so I, I i thought that this is the root of the problem the root of the problem is there are innovators who have technologies but they're not community builders and but there is existing communities and decentralized trust emerged out of these communities how can we take these things and channel it to these innovators whether they be from academia or from startups or like, you know, people doing their own research. And that's another amazing thing I found is the variety of like people who have come up with new tech techniques and technologies and, you know, out of like so many different backgrounds that just it's so amazing, right? People, you know, with an English literature degree coming up with consensus protocols and all these things that are so crazy and amazing that I, I really love that. But essentially enabling and empowering, whether it is an academic or it is somebody, uh, you know, from somewhere, you know, who has no pedigree, so to say, but has really good innovative ideas. How do you empower them to come and build on top of this common trust network? So that's what Eigenlayer's goal. Amazing. I love that. Yeah, it is democratizing it even further. And I think there's there's a parallel with the NFT space as well, because you have all these traditional artists that wanted to get involved in NFTs, but they're like, I don't want to have a social media. I don't want to make a community. And that's really what set those apart that got involved in the NFT space from being successful. Um, so that's really interesting. And I think that that will expand to a lot of use cases beyond just academia as well. Let's dive in. So what is Eigenlayer? Can you give us maybe the, the level five version, speak to me like I'm five, and then we can dig in further. Yeah, Eigenlayer is a mechanism uh, to share the security of Ethereum to any other like protocols whether they be new chains or there are new services built inside the Ethereum ecosystem like Oracle, data availability, bridges, uh, indexers, like anything uh, that, that really requires a decentralized validation network. How can we take the Ethereum trust network and supply portions of that to services that want to consume it? Another way of thinking about it is it's a marketplace for decentralized trust. So decentralized trust is the core ingredient underpinning blockchains, right? Like anything we would call a crypto solution versus not a crypto solution, the, the fundamental diff is that whether it has decentralized trust or not. And so if it does have decentralized trust, the question is like, can we kind of create a commodity out of decentralized trust? In some sense, that's really what Ethereum did this idea of block space as something generic and anybody can write any programs on top of it. And it was a way of taking decentralized trust and putting it into this 
bundle called a block and then selling it, right? So in some sense, Ethereum is the first marketplace for decentralized trust, but it's not flexible. It's not flexible in the sense that it has to be, you know, this EVM programs that are then executed through this consensus protocol run on these set of nodes. But if that consensus protocol had some inefficiencies, you are subject to the same inefficiencies as a builder. But what if you get more root access, more native access to flexible decentralized trust? You have the set of nodes that are running Ethereum. How can I take those set of nodes and have them opt in and participate in a market where they're selling their trust to anybody who wants to consume it? So raw access to decentralized trust, or I would say the first marketplace for flexible decentralized trust. That's what Eigenlayer is. Eigen comes from the German word Eigen for your own. And you know it's basically your own layer. We want to empower anybody to come and build their own layer on top of this common uh, trust framework. Amazing. Yeah. And I think that that's really what Web3 and crypto is all about. It's about giving everything back to the user, not just ownership, but also power and decision making. Let's double click into decentralized trust. Trust gets thrown around a lot. I think a lot of people get confused. They're like, well, why do, Why is me trusting someone a bad thing? So maybe can you double click into that and why you're passionate about it? Yeah, totally. I think the core principle that we're, uh, that when I realized I got really interested in blockchain was when I started observe, observing the following pattern, that whenever an innovator comes up with a new idea, right, imagine I'm building like some financial product or whatever, and imagine I'm building this in a pre-blockchain era. What is the thing I have to do? I have to go and run a server myself and say that, hey, you know, in this one, I'm recording all the transactions from various parties, arranging them and making sure I'm clearing these financial transactions. But now if I am running the server, I become the trust counterparty to every transaction that goes through. Am I including these transactions? Am I going to shut off the server? Am I running the right software? Am I man manipulating it? All kinds of problems. So innovator, the guy who comes up with the ideas also needs to be trusted. This is the sustaining moat of Wall Street. The sustaining competitive advantage of Wall Street is you have institutions that are that are trusted. They have lasted for several, you know, some hundred plus years because they have been suppliers of trust for like, you know, as escrows, as like trust counterparties in various kinds of transactions. And that enables them, trust has its own network effect, right? Like if you're already trusted, some more people will do transactions with you that will increase your trust and so on. And so it consolidates it into like very few entities. OK, so what this does is when somebody wants to be innovative, like imagine this, you know, 18 year old girl in Afghanistan and she has this really cool idea for how to write a financial, you know, derivative. Right. Like this is not a world we could have imagined like 10 years back, but it is happening today. And it is happening in a way that anybody can come and write these programs. And because they are not the ones who are running these programs, they they absorb the trust. They buy the trust or rent the trust from some existing trust base like an Ethereum blockchain. Then what happens is you don't need to know who they are and trust them, particularly for actually executing these things correctly you're trusting the blockchain to then execute these things correctly. And this is a huge leverage. It allows anybody to come and enter and create new services and maximizes the rate of innovation. And so this is the, the reason we are passionate about it. It is not that we don't want to trust each other. We absolutely, you know, human societies are built on trust of each other. But where should these points of trust lie? Should you go and trust one central entity and thereby consolidate all action into that entity and then put them in positions of power and rent seeking and control, as opposed to you borrow the trust from this emergent decentralized networks where there's no single party actually responsible or can control or can manipulate what is going on. And so there is no ability to rent seek, no ability to extort in the same way that uh, an analogous institution can. Amazing. You're giving me goosebumps because it just reminds me why we're even doing all of this. And I really appreciate that that look onto the space. And it's not just Wall Street, right? It's governments, it's tech companies, trusting information online. 
you know, the list goes on and on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think just to touch upon the company's part, right? Like we have, if you look at, you know, the top 20 companies, you know, of 2023 in market cap or whatever, you would find that most of them are digital platforms, right? And most of them are digital platforms. And essentially all they're doing is kind of, here is a trust source or like a meeting point on which everybody else comes and converges. And by building this hub and spoke structure where like everybody converges through that one server, the Facebook server or the Uber server or whatever the thing is, they have root access. And this root access, you know, in, in this space, we are all passionate about censorship resistance, which is the inability of a platform to censor people from participating. But I think, you know, there are dimensions of censorship resistance which are very little understood, I think at least outside. The idea is not just that any any user has equal ability to participate in the platform. It is also that any developer has equal access to build on top of that platform, which is a meta censorship resistance. The, not only the idea that this particular platform provides these ABCD features and then anybody has equal access to it. This platform has open APIs on which anybody can build anything on top, right? This is the biggest censorship going on in the world is by tech companies of censoring other applications to be built on top of their platform. You can say they are exerting their sovereign control, but this is not the correct architecture for maximizing the rate of innovation. Where is the plugin for me to go and specify which recommendation engine I want to use for my news feed on Facebook? Why isn't anybody building it? Because it's Facebook wouldn't let you build it. And so that's really the the fundamental problem on the uh, company side I think we are solving is these tech uh, digital platforms are basically exposing a breakdown of the market economy, which is predicated on competition. And basically there is no competition. And, and I usually allude to this example of the difference between something like airline networks and social networks and the total market cap of airline networks versus the total market cap of social networks. Why is social networks so much more valuable? Is it because it's giving us more value than all the airlines put together? No, it's because airlines are built on a competitive economy where if you compete, you have to compete for every unit of value relative to other providers, and it comes partly from the fact that things like airports are neutral and will allow any carrier to fly through them and they contain the network effects. So it's it's the same thing that blockchains do is blockchains are like these airports on which all the airlines, the services all have to compete fair and square in delivering value to the users. So that's that's our thesis on that. Totally. And I, I think, you know, Facebook and other like Google used to have these open APIs, but then they realized they needed to lock in users, get all of this attention so that they could sell them ads because they needed a business model. So they shut down a lot of applications. I think Vine was one of them. If you liked our recent episode with Matthew Gold on digital identity in Web3, then I have the perfect podcast for you. Web3 with A16C Crypto. Produced by venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, this podcast is your definitive resource for the future of the internet. From the latest trends to research and insights from top scientists, developers, and creators. And if you need somewhere to start, I'd highly recommend listening to their heavy-hitting episode with It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia's Rob McElhenney on the future of decentralized media. Follow Web3 with A16C Crypto on your favorite listening app. Tell them that Defiant sent you. I always say Web3 is the only platform and it's for truly decentralized applications to live upon. And even in, it's not just Web2 with these bad behaviors. In Web3, there are centralized companies that want to be that platform. I won't name names here, but I think we all know who they are and claim to be Web3, but really they just want to move the power and control to themselves. And that's all of, all of the money. So I think that's a very important point. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, a lot of people think that it's, it, it's a little bit confusing for people to wrap their heads around Eigenlayer being both the data availability layer and then also this restaking platform. Can you double click into how those two connect? Yeah, absolutely. Eigenlayer is the restaking platform. And, but, you know, so the restaking platform has two sides. One side is like, you know, stakers have to come and participate. The other side is some people have to build new infrastructure services on top. Building an infrastructure service is a long-term project, right? It takes a year, two years to deliver and build a new infrastructure service on top of a kind of a new framework. And so to bootstrap our own platform, 
we just ended up building the first service on top of this platform. So we asked the question, suppose we had this, uh, you know, cool restaking platform bootstrapped and it has a lot of staking and, you know, it has a lot of trust that comes into it. How can we uh, leverage it in providing some new innovative use case that solves some core problems in the Ethereum ecosystem? So this ended up being the data availability project that we are building on top of Eigenlayer. The data availability project is basically asking the following, trying to solve the following question in the Ethereum ecosystem. You know, coming from a wireless uh, background, you know, that, that was my PhD in peer-to-peer -peer wireless systems. Uh, I think a lot about bandwidth and, you know, as a kind of a fundamental metric. And, you know, because, you know, my mental model for crypto is it is a cooperation infrastructure or a cooperation superhighway. And if you want to build cooperation uh, uh, infrastructure, the core consideration is what is the cooperation bandwidth? What is the rate at which we can kind of like cooperate? I think that is the most important metric that I that I think about. And you can ask like, you know, one particular specific way of trying to measure it is I want to write data into a common ledger that does nothing else other than kind of like order and preserve the data. And if you try to use Ethereum like this, what is the data bandwidth that Ethereum offers? And without doing any computation, any other things, if you use Ethereum just for writing data, you can write 83 kilobytes per second. That's Ethereum's data bandwidth today. And, you know, I got into the internet when I was in 1994, you know, in India, and I had a dial-up modem, which was 56 kbps, uh, it's kilobits per second, but still it's, uh, it, it is, you know, not enough to run the world economy, which is our goal in this space, is to not only run, you know, financial services, but to run all digital platforms on top of this, like common decentralized trust infrastructure. And so the bandwidth that, that is being offered is not enough. And of course, Ethereum knows this and there is a evolution landscape of trying to build more and more scalable data availability services. But what we thought is now that we have this layer on which anybody can absorb the Ethereum trust and then build new services, can we build a hyperscaled data service on which if you write data into it, you can write it at very high bandwidths. So we're building this like thing, the data availability layer called EigenDA, where you can write data to it at you know 10 megabytes per second but each node doesn't download all the 10 megabytes per second each node only needs something like 0.2 megabytes per second so it's actually like horizontally scaling and it turns out pretty much no uh, existing project has this flavor where each node touches only like a very minimal amount of data but together the system has enough redundancy and stuff so that even if a lot of nodes go off, you can still recover all portions of data. So this is the uh, first use case. So Eigen DA, the data availability layer, is just the first use case that is being built on this Eigenlayer platform. But the Eigenlayer platform itself, the goal is to maximize the scale of open innovation and let people come up and build like new and crazy ideas on top. So amazing that with your background, you were able to see that bandwidth problem. And I feel like this is the remarkable thing about these decentralized networks and protocols is everyone around the world, like even with the graph, you know, realized early on that this indexing layer was missing and we wanted to build it in a decentralized way with the same values of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And sim similar with Eigenlayer, right? You see these problems and people from all around the world band together and come together to solve them. And it's just so, it's just such an exciting space to be in. Totally. I, yeah, I, I, I just love that ethos. Yeah, absolutely. So as a user, can you walk me a little bit through the user journey? So I want to borrow some trust. How does that, how does it work? Yeah, so uh, if I want to break down the set of possible uh, participants in the Eigenlayer ecosystem, there is a service builder who is, hey, I want to come and consume some trust from the Eigenlayer platform. There is the stakers who are the ones putting like economic value into the, into the Eigenlayer platform. Then there are node operators who could be the same as stakers, who could be different because Maybe some stakers just have money. They don't want to bother with running the services themselves. So you have these three-sided platform, right? Like stakers and node operators on one side, service builders on the other side. I'll walk through the stakers first so that, and then we can go to the builders. So stakers, what they do is, you know, uh, 
First, let's start with a simple version. You already have a liquid staking derivative, right? Like you have one of these liquid staking protocols like Rocket Pool or Lido or Coinbase, you know, depending on what trust assumptions you want to make, you go and give them the money. They give you this like derivative token, the CB ETH or like Lido ETH or the Rocket Pool ETH. You have these tokens and then you can use it for whatever. And one thing you could do is to take those tokens and deposit it into the Eigenlayer smart contracts. Eigenlayer is just a series of smart contracts on Ethereum, it's not a new layer one, it is not a new uh, blockchain, it's just a set of smart contracts on Ethereum. And what these smart contracts allow you to do is to take your stake and commit it to additional services and you know, you're putting it down to additional services and if you continue to provide those services correctly, then you will receive rewards. But if you maliciously try to manipulate these services, then you will lose your uh, stake. So that's the core set of framework. And so if you had a liquid staking derivative, you could just come and put it, you know, lock it into Eigenlayer. So that would be one, one model. Another model is what we call native restaking, which is, hey, I don't want to trust any of these like, you know, liquid staking providers. I want to be my own person. You know, we are all about sovereignty. So question is like, what can I do? How can I participate in Eigenlayer? What you do is you go and stake in the Ethereum protocol. When you stake in the Ethereum protocol, you can specify who is allowed to withdraw your stake. And nominally, you would say, hey, I'm allowed to withdraw my stake. Just set my wallet address to be able to withdraw my stake when I want to. But instead, what you do is with the uh, Eigenlayer, what you can do is you specify that withdrawal address should go to the Eigenlayer contracts. The Eigenlayer contracts basically hold the ability to withdraw your stake. In the normal happy path, whenever you want to trigger withdrawal, you go to the Eigenlayer contracts and say, hey, you know, I want to take my money out. It'll just let you withdraw your money and give you all the rewards that you've accrued through the Eigenlayer restaking. But if you've committed some malicious action in the Eigenlayer protocol, which is provable and verifiable on an Ethereum smart contract, then you may not be able to withdraw all your money. You may lose a portion of your stake. So that is the stakers like workflow. They, why, are they, why should they come here? They're getting additional yield in their like, you know, stake. They are able to support new services and like let this Ethereum ecosystem grow further. So that's the two reasons why like stakers would want to participate. They are essentially evaluating the additional risk that they're taking on this new protocols versus like the additional reward that they may be getting because of their participation in these additional protocols. That's the staker workflow. You may have a liquid staking derivative or you may be a native staker and you can participate. Both of them can equally participate in Eigenlayer. There is another uh, side, which is operators, right? When you stake, you can say who is going to run the node. So when you stake into, let's say, um, a decentralized storage protocol, uh, then you you have to commit some resources and run a node to actually do it. Are you doing it yourself or are you delegating somebody else to do it? This is open in Eigenlayer. You could either do it yourself or you could appoint somebody as your representative, somebody you trust as your representative to do it. And so that's the other side is operators. And why are they participating? They have expertise in running and maintaining node infrastructure. And uh, they are just providing a useful service to the uh, stakers in like not them not having to bother actually downloading and running these services. And so they are earning a cut of the fee because of that. So that's the operators. And finally, if I'm a service builder, you know, I, I want to build a new storage protocol. I want to build a new like consensus layer. You know, what do I need to do? is I come and write a smart contract. So let's say I want to write a storage protocol. I write a storage contract that talks to the Eigenlayer contracts. And the storage contract or the service contract in general specifies three conditions. Who can register? Should you have 32 ETH to register? Are like Coinbase ETH holders allowed to register or only native stakers allowed to register? What is the set of conditions? This is fully open and because this is a subjective judgment as to what set of risks that your service wants to take. And they can specify that. So that's registration conditions. Number two, you can specify uh, as a service builder what the payment conditions are. If you store one ETH, one gigabyte of data, you may get one ETH or whatever the serve payment conditions. You also specify what the slashing conditions are. And you may say something like, when I'm asking you to recall a random snippet of your data, if you don't serve the data and produce that particular chunk of data on Ethereum, you may lose your stake or a portion of the stake. So 
These are the three things you have specifying a smart contract registration condition, a smart contract payment condition, and a smart contract slashing condition. These three have to be return, return in the EVM contracts. But the actual service, the act of downloading, storing, allocating network, and all of this, you can write an off-chain node in arbitrary programming language. You basically can say anything, and it, it could be a new chain, you know, node software for a new chain. It could be a new decentralized indexing protocol. It could be a new storage protocol. It could be anything that you actually want. And so the then the operator will download that particular like off-chain software and run it. The staker opts into the particular contracts on and gives their explicit permission that they're opting into this storage contract. So that's the three sides of the market. It is a little complicated, but you know, uh, hopefully when all the sides of the market come together, there is some magic that can happen here. Absolutely. And it sounds like this is where the alpha is at. And I'm sure many of the listeners right now would love to be involved in this. So what advice do you have? I know on Twitter, Random Precision 5 wanted to know about the test net. You mentioned a private test net. How can people get involved in that? And, and when, when will it go public? Yes. Um, so the uh, r right now uh, we are having a private testnet for rollups. Essentially, you know, this is a private testnet on which we have EigenLayer and EigenDA, and the users of EigenDA are basically layer two rollups, which want to write data somewhere at a lower fee because right now most of the fee is writing data to Ethereum, and so that so we we have the rollup facing private testnet. If there are any layer two rollups out there which want to, you know, come and play with this uh, private testnet, just please DM us at the EigenLayer Twitter handle and we'll happily provide access to it. But as we, the next phase, we would have a, a testnet which covers some of the other sides of the protocol, which is where we expect more people to participate. Things like stakers, operators, and like, you know, service builders. And so that's what is coming up. Hopefully in Q2, we'll have some exciting announcements uh, uh, on the public testnet and the mainnet. Exciting. Okay, great. And then in a world where a stake can be restaked and then restaked again, is there a potential for slashing or, or liquidation cascades where misbehavior or bugs on one chain could result in slashing another chain? Yeah, definitely. And okay, so that is this risk that... Um, so. Eigenlayer is shared security, right? And shared security also brings shared risks. And I think that's what we are talking about, right? Like, you know, we're all pooling together and sharing this zone of security, but if like the security is broken somewhere, it's broken for everybody. So that is really a problem. Uh, it's a problem and it is a strength, right? So the way, for example, you know, one analogy that we like a lot in the space is like blockchains are like nation states, right? And you know, if you if you take an analogy like that, you can think of dApps as like cities, applications are like cities, and you could say, yeah, you know, I just want to build a city state. But actually, like, you know, it makes more sense to pool all the security and just build a bigger security force and then have that bigger security force then like defend all the cities together because it has a much higher joint security budget. In fact, the best outcome we think on Eigenlayer is that the entire security, all the each stakers opt into all the services. That's what one would like worry most about if you think about it from a financial point of view, it's the most over leveraged, right? Like you're taking the same stake and putting it into everything. But actually, if you think about it, Ethereum's already like that in one way. And you know, in what way? Ethereum basically has a common pool of security that supplies that security to every dApp on Ethereum equally, right? Like, and every new dApp in some sense over leverages the security, right? Like every new application is basically increasing the profit for an attack, but not increasing the cost of the attack. And you know, in fact, people speculated back in like 2015 that when Ethereum was just going live, that this kind of an architecture is inherently unstable. And we found that that's not true because there is a second order effect. The second order effect is as more dApps come on board, there is more, more fee revenue. And more fee revenue means more is being staked. And more is being staked and more fee revenue is being absorbed means basically ETH itself grows in value. So there's a, there's a first order effect, which is, you know, you are over leveraging security. The second order effect is that you're actually 
the increased fee means that there is an increased staking. The third order effect is that the increased fee opportunities in the future means ETH itself increases in value. And these three things have worked to make Ethereum like underlying uh, system grow from like a hundred million dollar worth protocol, like maybe four years back to like a you know hundred plus billion dollar protocol now, right? And it's able to support a much broader pool of security. So we believe the eigenlayer mechanism will do something similar, especially when everybody restakes on everything. The idea is that now you have this common pool of security, now you're able to offer the security to many, many services. Where this analogy breaks down is if there was a bug in one of the service contracts, then you know there is no protection because what we're seeing is the cost of attacking any one service is now the cost of attacking the entire ecosystem because once you break the security, you can break it for everything. But it's also like a huge amount of money, right? It's 20, 30 billion dollars and it's gonna be very difficult for an attacker to attack at that scale and get away with it. But the problem that we're worried about and we should be worried about is the problem of what if the services have buggy or malicious smart contracts? So I write a smart contract, it says it only slashes people who don't store data, but because there is a bug, it flashes everybody and it takes everybody's money away. Right? These are the things that lead to cascade risks. And the way we try to mitigate these systemic risks is by having a common uh, uh, training wheel, a layer of governance which can veto the slashing. You know, so slashing for slashing to occur, not only the service contract should make an objective claim on Ethereum, but also it has to be obje- it has to be approved by this kind of like a committee. And this we think of for each service, there should be a period where they are subjecting themselves to a veto like this before they say that, oh, I don't I don't need any of the human subjectivity. I'm ossifying in code and only, you know, my code is law. And you need like a period of time before each service goes from you know, having a layer of human subjectivity to not requiring a layer of human subjectivity. So that's that's what we think the, the as a mitigation for systemic risk. But individual risk is actually not that high. Why is individual risk not that high? Is because normally when you're leveraging up in a financial protocol, what happens is you are taking essentially almost all financial protocols, you're underwriting some price risk right you're basically you know putting your token down to underwrite some kind of a price risk and that's how you're earning non zero yield in these you know defi primitives but validation is a new category and why is validation a new category because if i know i'm validating correctly then i will not get slashed if i know i'm validating correctly i will not get slashed but you don't know that i'm validating correctly so i'm putting down my money where my mouth is right i'm saying i'm validating correctly and you are like i don't know who you are i don't i don't want to believe you but then i'm putting my money down and saying that hey if i do something wrong like you can take my money away so validation trust is is emerging upon this information asymmetry between the validating node and the consuming service and because you know the person who's themselves putting it at, at validation risk, even among 100 protocols, knows that they will not get slashed if they do not misbehave, that the type of risk, over leveraging risk that each staker is taking is fundamentally very different from you know, a risk that somebody takes by levering up a 10x or 100x in a financial protocol where a 1% price movement can wipe out your entire money. And that's not, so because it's not price risk, it's validation risk, I think it needs a new paradigm to understand and see through these risks. Totally. And I guess another question that Taylor's on this comes from Miko Mastumura, and he asked, is eigenlayer degen, meaning that validators could get tempted at a higher yield of round money printing, and could that then comprise the security and stability of the network? What would you say to his question? <laughs> it, I, I could lead to degen behavior I, uh, and uh, for example one of the degen behaviors that it could lead to is that uh, you know that just like uh, new services when they bootstrap they may provide you know fees in their own token instead of providing fees in ETH and you know just the speculation of this can can be interesting for stakers to then go and participate in these new you know opportunities. Um, and what if some of them were actually like, you know, genuinely malicious? And this is why we are enforcing a uniform slashing veto, like comprised of, 
you know, prominent Ethereum community members who can, whenever slashing is triggered, they have to approve it in order for slashing to happen. And so we also want this committee to carefully onboard protocols so that protocols need to be audited and stuff before stakers opt in. So, you know, we're trying to do our best to mitigate the risks, but at the end of the day, with great power comes great responsibility. So if you're putting your own stake at risk, you have to do your own research. And that is a part of the framework. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's built into the Web3 space, right? You have to take that responsibility yourself. And, and that's really what it's all about. MetaMask Learn is an educational platform designed to immerse you in the world of Web3, what it is, why it matters, and how to get started. You will learn core concepts in fresh and engaging lessons from the world's leading self-custodial wallet. MetaMask Learn is for you if you've been interested in Web3 but just don't know where to start, you've bought some crypto on an exchange but don't know what to do with it, you still don't understand Web3 principles because they've been too jargon heavy, and you want to know what the fuss about Web3 really is. Let's double click into that governance layer. I know it got a little spicy on Blockworks, but can you talk to us a little bit about what that will look like, who will be involved, and will you decentralize that further over time? Yes. So what, what the governance layer looks like is it's basically a group of Ethereum community like, you know, builders like, uh, you know, who can uh, either they're building core, their core devs in the protocol, they're building layer tools, they're building new middlewares, you know, maybe people from the graph, you know, essentially the broader Ethereum and crypto ecosystem participating in this. And what are they doing? They're doing something very narrow in scope. They're basically saying when a slashing is approved, is it a legitimate slashing? Is the contract claims that they should be slashed for like whatever they didn't store the data, or they didn't validate correctly. And is it a smart contract bug or is it not a bug? It is not a subjective judgment about, is this token gonna go up? Is this like a good project? Is this a nice guy? Like it's not those kind of judgments. They're making an objective, very roughly objective judgment. It's just not programmatized. Uh, the idea that like this slashing is triggered for a genuine like misbehavior on validators or is this slashing triggered for, you know, some other purpose. And that's all of the judgment that they have. And this is kept in eigenlayer to be wrapped. Like when a service triggers slashing, it is only supposed to trigger slashing in extreme conditions. Its safety is broken. Majority of nodes misbehaved. It's not something as light as, oh, one node didn't respond in time for 30 seconds and I'm going to remove a little bit of stake. So this is not the eigenlayer trust model. Eigenlayer trust model is if your trust is broken in some basic way, then you can trigger a slashing event. And so part of the onboarding process would be that this committee would just check these basic conditions that, you know, it triggers conditions rarely, it's been subject to, you know, audits and stuff, and then onboard them. And the assurance you get as a staker is that there is the dual backstop, which is not only that an objective contract has to trigger the slashing, but the subjective committee also has to approve the slashing. And the committee by itself cannot like trigger new slashing and like, like take everybody's eat away. So it's a dual layer of like objectivity plus human subjectivity, which is then triggers the slashing. So as far as the stakers are concerned, the trust model is, you know, their trust model is broken when both the contracts were wrong and malicious and the state and this committee is wrong and malicious. And how do we get this committee is, it's not a group of token holders in either the Eigen ecosystem or some other ecosystem because we believe token governance is subject to more manipulation than, but the way we think about it is if there is a kind of, uh, you know, a DAO or something for the Eigen layer, then those commit the, that they may comprise of, you know, ecosystem participants, but they vote on this like, you know, slashing committee. And this slashing committee vote is triggered and uh, it unchanged only with a long delay, like a one month or whatever. And so what that does is, you know, both the sides, when they kind of participate on Eigenlayer, both services and stakers, they participate only if they kind of trust this middle layer of like, you know, uh, uh, staking uh, uh, the slashing veto. And, so we are building it to have like two modes. Uh, the second mode will turn on eventually, which is the idea that initially we need everything to go through the slashing veto. Eventually after some of the services have, 
you know, been tested in the wild for enough, they move off from a layer where they don't need to be part of the slashing veto and they go on to a layer where they don't need to be, you know, part of the sl slashing veto. They can basic. they need to convince the stakers that even though there is no slashing veto, they are trusted enough that, you know, stakers can opt into them. So that's the model where there is training wheels and these can be removed once you're ossified. And there is kind of a balance of power between the economic interest in the protocol and the the immediate trust and safety still cannot be compromised even if you own a large fraction of the DAO or whatever. So that's that's how we are thinking about it. Great, yeah, I'm a, a big believer in governance minimization, uh, and I. But I guess double clicking in incentives really they are everything. And so, how are all of these participants going to be incentivized? And you know, rewinding a little bit, I think part of the problem with Web two is that the incentives weren't thought about before product market fit and building happened, and that's how we ended up with some of the negative externalities of Web two today. So, how are you thinking about the incentive structure? Yeah, so. You know, I think uh, this is one of the places where I think uh, the more the participation we get in in the diversity of thoughts that go into understanding second order, third order effects. I think I have kind of commented on to the level that we understand these are the different sets of incentives, you know, for the different participants. Stakers are there for additional yields. Operators are there for additional validation opportunities. Builders are there because it enables them to bootstrap a new economy uh, and the trust model underlying, you know, all of this putting together. But, you know, there may be uh, other second order, third order like ramifications of this that we haven't yet fully understood. And so we are open to involving closely with the community. We are starting a discourse uh, page where like we are going to start involving the broader community in discussing these issues of you know, uh, how we understand over leveraging, how we understand security risks, how we understand degening behavior. You know, some of these we may understand more natively and others we may understand less. Uh, so we want to and, and you know, involve the entire community to, to participate in it. Yeah. Great. Amazing. Let's talk a little bit about business model. How are you thinking about the business model of Eigenlayer? Will there be a token? <laughs> The uh, the business model is basically, you know, it's a marketplace. So there is uh, there are services paying the stakers a certain fee. So there will be an opportunity to take a f small fraction of the fee when the payment is happening. So that is the eventual business model of Eigenlayer. And, you know, whether, you know, it's somewhat like Uniswap, right? Like you have these two sides. There is like liquidity providers and traders in Uniswap. Instead, we have security providers, which is stakers, and then security consumers, which is services, which are the two sides of the market. And so there is a natural uh, business model coming out of it. Um, whether there is a token is essentially a question of when we decentralize the governance structures uh, around it. And, you know, how do you trade off the thing about like agility, which is needed when you start the project? and decent, eventual decentralization, which is absolutely needed to make sure that the project can function towards the common good. So, you know, we are thinking through like the timeline for that. Got it. And when you mentioned that fee, would that go then to the token holders? Or I assume it wouldn't go to like a centralized company within the eigenlayer space? No, so that that's what the, the it would basically go back to some kind of like a DAO treasury or something where that can be used in funding, you know, uh, the development and innovations around this platform. So that's what it, it would be eventually. Yeah. OK, great. And let's talk a little bit about the future once Eigenlayer is solidified. What does that change within the Ethereum ecosystem? What are you excited about? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, I was mentioning this thing about how when academics or other innovators come into the space, they have to both create the technology and the community by decoupling these two things and having like a pool of decentralized trust that can be supplied flexibly to any technologies. Now, like technical advantages can be internalized back into the Ethereum ecosystem, right? One of the cool things that happened when Ethereum launched is the composability of dApps, right? So you have all these dApps and they can all compose with each other and create like emergent structures, like these flash loans and, and all these interesting things. 
and we think there is a corresponding composability of distributed systems. Somebody builds a distributed like data dispersal protocol, somebody builds a distributed you know, secret protocol, somebody dis, uh, uh, creates a secure multi-party protocol and so on. And all of these things can compose with each other to create some new fun uh, outcomes and people can bundle them together to create new chains and new applications for users. So this is, uh, this is one side where we are kind of very uh, uh, excited for the uh, Ethereum ecosystem. Got it. And then as I'm thinking about this a little bit, with a layer two as an example that spins up on Eigenlayer, and maybe they don't want to have a token, they don't want to build their community, how do they then incentivize that ecosystem? How do you see that? Yes. So for example, imagine like I'm a, I just want to run a company and this company is building this new service. Let's say it's like a new chain and I don't want to have a new token or anything. The way you incentivize the stakers is simply, hey, you know, when I'm running this Reddit chain, let's say, and, you know, the fees are being paid, the fees go, you know, a fraction of the fees go to the stakers and a fraction of the fees go to my, like, Reddit company wallet, right? Like, this could be a model. And it's a very simple model. It's somewhat analogous to software as a service kind of solutions in the cloud, right? Like, you create this software solution, which is a distributed thing and you throw it on top of eigenlayer and let like the eigenlayer the ethereum stakers get a fraction of the fee every time that that software is triggered and one one thing i wanted to say like as far as the impact to the ethereum ecosystem is i think for the first time eigenlayer potentially incentivizes decentralization so till now when we talk about decentralization right like there is always an incentive to centralize there is no incentive to decentralize. There is a religious and like a community feeling that decentralization is better, but there is no object to pay out, which is imagine like there are 1 million stakers, each of them stake $1,000 versus there is like one guy staking 1 billion. One guy staking 1 billion has an advantage because he just needs to run one node and one signatory and it's much simpler. So there is an amortization benefit of like one guy. But actually the whole value of our ecosystem is that there is decentralized trust, but there is no way for valuing decentralized trust because it cannot be objectively evaluated. But the cool thing is it can be subjectively evaluated, right? Each service coming up on Eigenlayer, for example, can say that I need these nodes to be decentralized, otherwise they cannot participate. And that's part of the registration condition is that only these, these nodes, which I subjectively determine, they're dispersed around the world, they're run by home stakers, they're run by this kind of nodes and so on, only they can participate in my protocol. Then what happens is the yield starts turning towards the more decentralized nodes. Because, you know, the restakers who are more decentralized get additional staking opportunities and yield opportunities that are simply unavailable to the more centralized group. And this is something that we are very excited about. The fact that for the first time, you, because, you know, if we think of ourselves as the marketplace for decentralized trust, the first thing that you want to do is to understand the dimensions of decentralized trust. And, you know, how how decentralized nodes are is an important dimension of decentralized trust, not just how much stake is there on the platform. And so people will pay because there are services that absolutely need such decentralization. So that's something that we're very excited about for the Ethereum ecosystem. Absolutely. And I think that there is some confusion around centralized companies will still exist in Web3. They, we just can't have centralized infrastructure. And so I think that that business model that you mentioned really touches on that. Um, as an example, Edge Node is one of the many centralized companies in, in the graph ecosystem. We exist in the context of that decentralized infrastructure. Um, so I think that you hit, hit home on that point. Are there any other business models that you can imagine spinning up uh, aside from the one you mentioned? Yes, I think the one I mentioned is the more most web to or like a company native type of uh, business model. There'll be many crypto native business models built on like Eigenlayer. For example, a new service comes and they create their own tokenized economy around it. And they say that, you know, when you participate in my ecosystem, you're getting rewards, not necessarily in fees, because maybe there is not enough fees on day one to opt in and validate my users, but I'm giving you a fraction of ownership in my network, a, a voice in governance of my network. And that is an interesting reward for many people to participate in that particular like service ecosystem. So 
that's another business model there's another model that could happen which is which is that like you start saying that to uh, validate on my uh, oracle let's say it is not enough that you know ethereum stakers you know vote and say that yes this is the price feed but i also need my own token stakers to vote and say that this is the price feed and these two have to agree so we call this the dual quorum model and the idea in this is that there is some game theory that you get from ethereum stakers putting their stake and subjecting themselves to slashing conditions on the eigenlayer protocol but there's also a different economic exposure that you get via um having price exposure and value alignment with your own ecosystem so you may want to have like the dual staking uh business model where you say that you know to participate in my protocol you know there are two groups of stakers one is the ethereum stakers who have to vote on the inputs but also my own token stakers who have to vote on the input and both of them have to agree for any input to be considered valid so there is a variety of business models i think we'll see a lot of innovations in the economics around this Amazing. I think that's always super helpful to get people thinking about what's possible with this technology. And then talk a little bit about how you're structuring the development of Eigenlayer, the protocol versus the company. Yeah. So this is what I meant by the eventual decentralization. The idea is that we start off as this like core nucleus that seeds this ecosystem, but then eventually this ecosystem grows goes off and lives off on its own. So that's the model that uh that we want to want to build and we will be one maybe group of builders building on eigen layer and there'll be other people continuing to build but there's also this uh, emergent decentralized governance that will come up where you know essentially uh, which can fund new public goods to then be built on top of eigen layer which may or may not be done by our company so that's the model that we want to go to we are in the early phases of understanding the uh the uh the direction to decentralization that we want to take yeah great and you know decentralization it's become kind of a buzzword in the space people throw it around they don't necessarily always mean it and it seems to me that you are very passionate about decentralization can you speak a little bit about why it's important to you yeah the um If you look at the core uh the the core reason that we want decentralized trust right like there are really two distinct concepts i think uh which are usually um uh, not distinguished i think one is what i would call the concept of competitive intermediation the idea is you know in something like web2 you have a single intermediary which has like full root access and power on that system they don't have to compete with anybody else to maintain that position so their position is permanent and guaranteed like the facebook server is the only thing that can run the facebook you know infrastructure right but one of the things that happened in crypto is competitive intermediation which is for example in bitcoin miners have to compete with each other in providing service and only the most competitive and the most you know efficient will stay inside that marketplace and so that's a very interesting uh you know paradigm but to enforce competitive intermediation we need decentralized validation the idea that like many many nodes are monitoring and making sure that only you know even if you control 50% of bitcoin blocks you are not going to be able to make invalid blocks because you know all the users are running this software node software that is going to reject it if that turns out to be the case and there are many many instances of services where you know you need a decentralized like group of nodes to run it otherwise you don't get the stated features of that service imagine that you're taking some data splitting it into small chunks and then distributed distributing it across many nodes right it's called shamir secret sharing and this idea that like your if all of these nodes collude together then your secret is exposed and this is not an attributable fault it's not an attributable fault because they may like get together in a private room and expose the data they may do it some other crazy thing for which you cannot even attribute that they did this thing but so the thing is you know there are many many examples of services where the only protection that you have is that a majority of nodes don't collude and the difficulty in collusion is built out of decentralization and that's really why i think decentralization is a kind of fundamental value that we should aspire to which maintains a layer of credible neutrality 
and then people can compete to provide you know services because it is not practical that uh, the layer of efficiency goes away if every node has to do everything like then you know what about i am the most efficient person at doing this so i should be doing it that there is a value to it but only to the extent that you are more efficient than others you should have a place so there should be a layer of credible neutrality that then adjudicates that so that's why i think both the paradigm of decentralized validation and competitive intermediation i think these are the two paradigms that work together to make it possible absolutely appreciate that breakdown and then another question is just around how can the community get involved janice z on crypto asked when discord and when roadmap yeah so we are uh, uh uh we are hoping to have an updated you know website and uh, discord discourse to start with in the next you know uh by the end of this month basically where we'll have much more uh ways to participate uh we're also looking at launching a discord around the time of our public test net where like you know uh, everybody can participate as of now there is an unofficial telegram group that uh, some people have created the community members have created and there is some amount of interaction we have there amazing and then last question is just how are you defiant <laughs> um you know you asked me also to to finish the whole thing back right like i started in uh in in the uh academic uh landscape where you know um where the core value on the one side is uh innovation but also there is a lot of conservatism around like hey you know this is uh is this you know edge of culture and why you participating in this thing and actually i find i uh, the the set of values and ethos that you know a large fraction of our community members have is actually much more aligned to the core values of uh academia itself which is you know how do you create public goods how do you create more innovation how do you create like more you know cooperation at large scale and you know i wouldn't say i'm defiant but there are other people who do say that i am defiant <laughs> and going in uh in this direction yeah well, that's very nice i know i'm reading good to great and they say level 5 leaders never take credit for themselves and always give it to the team so uh you check the box there well thank you so much for for coming on the defiant it was really great to dig into to i can layer and also your background thank you so much taken uh really appreciate this had a great chat 